Attention on deck. Please be seated. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Colonel Art Athens. I have the honor and privilege of serving as the uh, Center Director for the Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership here at the Naval Academy. And I'd like to welcome you to the William C. Studd Ethics Speaker Series. Mr. Studd, for whom the lecture is named, is a 1949 graduate of the Naval Academy where he lettered on the varsity lacrosse team. He served in the Navy for five years and then began postgraduate work at the London School of Economics and earned a master's in business administration from the Harvard Business School. Mr. Studd joined the investment firm of Goldman Sachs and eventually became a limited partner in this prestigious firm. Mr. and Mrs. Studd established this speaker series in 2005. The Studds were interested in this particular series because they understood the importance of thinking deeply about ethics, character, and leadership while one attends the academy in preparation for leading sailors and marines in the fleet and the operating forces. Our distinguished and accomplished guest speaker tonight is Mr. David Brooks. Mr. Brooks became an op-ed columnist for the New York Times in September of 2003. In addition to his responsibility with the Times, he provides commentary for the PBS NewsHour, National Public Radio's All Things Consider, and NBC's Meet the Press. He has been a senior editor at the Weekly Standard, a contributing editor at Newsweek and the Atlantic Monthly, and worked at the Wall Street Journal in a range of positions, including op-ed editor. He is the author of Bobos in Paradise, The New Upper Class and How They Got There, and On Paradise Drive, How We Live Now and Always Have in the Future Tense. In March of 2011, he came out with his third book, The Social Animal, The Hidden Sources of Love, character and achievement, which was a number one New York Times bestseller. Mr. Brooks also teaches at Yale University and is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. We are most fortunate to have Mr. Brooks with us this evening to address the road to character. Please join me in welcoming Mr. David Brooks. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, I thought I'd uh, model my remarks today after the Katy Perry show yesterday. Uh, come out here riding a tiger, then model after the Seattle Seahawks and blow it with 20 seconds left. Uh, <laughs> yeah, all the New England fans. Uh, no, it, it really is a pleasure to be here. I uh, came from a, a slightly different upbringing maybe than many of you. I grew up in Greenwich Village in New York in the 1960s sort of a hippie area. My parents were somewhat left-wing then. They took me to a, a thing the, six, the hippies would do in the 60s called a bee-in, which is where in Central Park in New York where hippies would go just to be. Uh, and they would uh, set a garbage can on fire and they threw their wallets into the garbage can uh, to demonstrate how little they cared about money and material things. And I was five years old and I saw a $5 bill burning in the garbage can. So I re broke from the crowd, reached into the flames, grabbed the money and ran away. That, that was sort of my first step over to the right. Uh, and then, uh, uh, I was extremely fortunate, maybe like some of you, to know what I wanted to do early in my life. At age seven, I decided I wanted to become a writer. I read these books called Paddington, the Bear Stories. If anybody read that, and I said, I'm going to do that. And writing has really been my life ever since. I remember in high school, I wanted to date a woman named uh, Bernice, and she didn't want to date me. She wanted to date some other guy. And I remember thinking, what is she thinking? I write way better than that guy. <laughs> but people had different values. Uh, and, and then I, I went to um, a university uh, called the University of Chicago, which makes this place look like Party Central. Uh, the slogan about Chicago is, it's the place where fun goes to die. Uh, and then uh, into career journalism. Uh, and I've spent a career covering people like you a few years older in various theaters around the world, uh, and I've had a chance to spend some time here, and it's a, it is a great pleasure uh, to be here. Now, I've spent the last four or five years 
thinking about the difference between uh, the resume virtues and the eulogy virtues. Uh, there are certain virtues you put on your resume, which is the stuff you bring to the marketplace, the stuff you bring to your job. Are you good at math? Are you good in Excel spreadsheets? Uh, are you good at marketing? Are you good at speaking? And then there are certain virtues that they talk about you after you're dead. Uh, and these are deeper parts of yourself. Are you honest? Were you courageous? Were you uh, straightforward? Were you capable of deep and permanent loves? Were you obedient to those who deserve your obedience? And most of us know the eulogy virtues are more important than the, than the resume virtues. And yet, I think we grow up in a culture uh, that puts great emphasis on the resume virtues, to how well you do in life, to the external climb of success, and more than the inner development of character. And so I've tried to spend a lot of time learning from people who did develop good character how it's done. And one of the books that helped me think about that was a book by a guy named Joseph Soloveitchik, which came out in 1965, called The Lonely Man of Faith. And Soloveitchik said we have two sides of our nature. Each of us has two personalities inside, which he called Adam One and Adam Two. Adam One is majestic Adam. That's the external Adam, the one who wants to have a great career, build, produce things, discover things, become famous, win victories on the sports fields or anywhere else. Adam Two is humble Adam. Adam Two is the internal Adam, the eulogy Adam. Adam Two wants to be enveloped by love, security, wants to serve others, heal the world, not only to do good externally, but to be good inside and to have an inner soul that honors God, creation, and one's possibilities. So while Adam 1 wants to conquer the world, Adam 2 wants to hear a calling and serve the world. Adam 1 savors accomplishments. Adam 2 savors the scent and the warmth of family life, the scent of a warm meal, the joy of guys and girls having a beer together. Adam 1 asks how things work. Adam 2 asks why things exist and what ultimately we're here for. Adam 1 wants to venture forth. Adam 2 wants to return to roots, to where you came from. Adam 1's motto is success. Adam 2's motto is love, redemption, and return. And Soloveitchik argued that we live in the contradiction between these two Adams. Both sides have to be in balance. You want to have a great external career, but you want to be good inside. And if you're not good inside, eventually your external life will fall apart. Your Watergate will come. It's like Nixon. He was a brilliant politician. He did not have a solid Adam II. His life fell apart. And I'd say the hard part about these, this confrontation between these two Adams is they live by different logics. Adam I lives by an economic logic, which is straightforward. It's part of sports. It's part of a lot of what you guys do. Input leads to output, effort leads to reward, practice makes perfect. The internal Adam II lives by a different logic, which is a moral logic and not an economic one. You have to give to receive. You have to surrender something outside yourself to gain strength within yourself. You have to conquer your desire to get what you crave. Success leads to the greatest failure, which is pride. And failure leads to the greatest success, which is humility and learning. In order to fulfill yourself, you have to forget yourself. In order to find yourself, you have to lose yourself. So we live in a society that rewards the external success. You know, I'm here because I've achieved some external career success. But I found in the course of my life that if you have this external success without really focusing on your Adam II, the inner side, you live a life of moral mediocrity. You sort of think, ah, I'm not hurting anybody. People seem to like me well enough but you begin to find yourself sliding down. You find a humiliating gap between the person you hoped you'd be and the person you actually are. And so I really spent a lot of time thinking, you know, how does this Adam II develop? How do you be articulate about it? And so I started thinking about what is character? We use the word character, and I know that in this place the word character is used a lot. But when we use that word, what do we mean? The first thing we mean, I think, is length and consistency over time. The lead, things that lead us astray are short-term, lust, fear, vanity, gluttony. The things we call character are long-term, courage, honesty, and humility, having a long obedience in the same direction. 
So can you be the same person day after day after day in times good and bad? Consistency. The second thing we mean is scope, attachment to things broad. A person with character is not free floating by himself or herself, he or she is attached. In the realm of the intellect, that person is attached to permanent convictions about fundamental things. They have a worldview. They know what they think is true. Second, in the realm of emotions, a web of unconditional loves. There are people they love, and it doesn't matter what those people will do, their love is unshakable. Third, in the realm of actions, a permanent commitment to a task that can't be completed in a single lifetime. Not something you can do today or tomorrow, but something that will take generations to do, which you are a small part of. So there's a solidity to such a person. There's iron in the soul. Now, the soul is a word that's uncomfortable. A lot of us don't quite know what it means. But it simply means that there's a core piece of us, that piece which makes moral decisions, and the soul doesn't care if you get a promotion. That core piece of you is slowly malleable by you. If you make disciplined choices, you build that core piece into something disciplined and coherent that you'll be able to count on. If you make selfish and short-sighted choices, you can degrade that core piece. You can make it inconstant, fragmented, and your life will fall to pieces. You can degrade that core piece even if you're not hurting anybody else, even if you're sitting alone in a room having degraded thoughts. And the way you make yourself trustworthy is just build that core piece, a history of disciplined and trustworthy choices. So that's what I think we mean when we use the word character. Then the question becomes, what are the activities that help us, that lead to character, that really help us build character? When we say someone is deep, they have good character, what do we think they've gone through in their lives? The first thing is they're capable of deep love. I live in Washington, the most emotionally avoidant city on the face of the earth. And we don't talk, if you were, use the word love in Washington, they look at you like you're Oprah. But we wouldn't say someone is really has character unless they were really capable of great love. And the kind of love that I'm talking about was represented to me in a, in a, a, a paragraph I read in a book a couple years ago. It was written by a guy named Douglas Hofstetter, who was a mathematician at Indiana University. And he had gone on sabbatical with his wife, Carol, and their two kids were at that point, I think, five and two, to Italy. And Carol had suddenly died of an aneurysm. And he kept a photo of Carol on the nightstand by his bed. And he probably looked at that photo every day after her death. But one day he looked at it with particular attention. And here's what he wrote. I looked at her face and I looked so deeply that I felt I was behind her eyes. And all at once I found myself saying as tears flowed, that's me, that's me. And those simple words brought back many thoughts that I had had before about the fusion of our souls into one higher level entity, about the fact that at the core of both our souls lay our identical hopes and dreams for our children, about the notion that those hopes were not separate or distinct hopes, but were just one hope, one clear thing that defined us both, that welded us into a unit, the kind of unit I had but dimly imagined before being married and having children. I realized that though Carol had died, that core piece of her had not died at all, but that it had lived on very determinedly in my brain. So he's talking about a fusion of souls and a fusion of minds. And somebody who is capable of, who has character, is capable of the vulnerability and the openness required to have that kind of fusion with friends and with a spouse. You guys are probably 10 years away from it, but I guarantee that the person you decide to marry, it's the most important decision you'll make in your life and a marriage is a 50-year conversation. Marry someone you can talk to for 50 years. But love is the essence of character. So what does love do? First thing it does, it humbles you. You realize when you're in love, you're not even in control of your own brain. It's like an invading army that you want to be conquered by. It changes your sleep patterns. It changes who you think about and what you think about. It makes you behave in stupid ways. So love humbles you. You're not in control of yourself. The second thing love does is it decenters the self. Egotism is a desperate longing in a small space. Love, a person in love realizes that the center of his or her life is not in himself, it's in another person. That the riches of the world are in another person. So 
it makes you think less about yourself and more about that other person. Many observers have noticed that love eliminates the distinction between giving and receiving. When your friend allows you to give him a gift, he's doing you the ultimate pleasure, giving you the chance to give a gift to your friend. Because lovers and friends have the boundary between themselves is broken down. So when you give your, a gift to your friend or to your lover, you're giving to a piece of yourself. So it makes you more vulnerable. Love opens up, it's like a plow that opens up hard ground. We all are toughened by life, you're toughened by service, but when you're in love, you're opened up and the fertile, soft, vulnerable ground comes out and it makes you capable of more love. Self-control is like a muscle. If you're resisting self-control, over the course of a day, it's gonna be tougher at night to impose self-control on yourself. It wears out. Love is not like that. People who have second and third children don't love the first one less. They're just capable of greater love. And so what love does is it drags you down into humility, it gets you out of yourself because your riches are outside yourself, and then it lifts you up into service and holiness. Because a person in love wants to serve the beloved. One of my heroes is a woman named Dorothy Day. She was like a social worker in the early 20th century. And she, uh, had a, she was one of these people when she read books, she began to act like the characters in the books. And unfortunately, she read a lot of Dostoevsky. And so she drank a ton, she slept around a ton, um, had two abortions, two suicide attempts, and her life was a wreck. But she had a child uh, out of wedlock in her late 20s, and she wrote a piece about having that child, and one of the sentences she wrote about that piece was, if I had painted the greatest painting, sculpted the greatest sculpture, composed the greatest symphony, I could not have felt the more exalted creator than I felt when they placed my child in my arms, and with that came a need to worship and to adore. And she turned her worship to God, and the rest of her life was focused on service. And people in love need to serve the people they love. They need to pay back the gratitude for the great gift they've been giving. So love humbles you, decenters you, and then leads to service. The second thing we'd say, somebody who's got character, we'd say they've endured a lot of suffering, or at least some serious episode of suffering. When we plan our lives, we plan forward for happiness. We want to be happy. But when you ask somebody, what was the activity that really made you who you are? You never, nobody ever says, well, I went on a vacation in Hawaii and was awesome. That's not what forms us. What forms us is moments of suffering. They always talk about some moment of challenge. And so people plan for happiness, but are shaped by suffering. So what does suffering do? Well, there's a theologian in the 1950s named Paul Tillich. He said what suffering does is it digs you deeper into yourself and reminds you you're not the person you thought you were. He, his metaphor was like you've got a basement in the core of yourself and suffering plows into that basement and it carves out the floor revealing a cavity below, then it carves out that floor revealing a cavity below and it takes you into deeper parts of yourself than you ever knew imagined. So like love, suffering humbles you. But then it, suffering gives you a sense of calling. When people suffer, they wanna turn that suffering into something important. I have friends back in DC who uh, lost a child when he was six, a guy named Henry, a kid named Henry. And when they lost their child, they didn't say, well, we lost our child, we had two years of grieving, that was miserable, we should go out and party for two years to make it even. No one says that. They decided they wanna take their son's death and make it meaningful, so they created a foundation called Hope for Henry, so it would be attached to some transcendent cause. And so, just like love, it humbles you, gets you out of yourself, and then it leads you to service, that V-shape. The third thing that somebody with character has is um, the ability to defeat their own weaknesses, to take their weakest spot and turn it into their strongest spot. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower grew up in Abilene, Kansas. When he was eight or nine, he wanted to go out trick-or-treating. And his mom, this remarkable woman named Ida Eisenhower, wouldn't let him. In those days, trick-or-treating was more like mischief night. It was rougher. And so he threw a temper tantrum and he punched the tree in his front yard so bad that he rubbed all the skin off his fingers. 
And so his mom sent him to his room and had him cry there for an hour. Uh, and then she came up to him an hour later and she bound his wounds. And she recited to him a verse from Proverbs. And that verse was, he that conquereth his own soul is greater than he who taketh the city. And when Eisenhower wrote his memoirs 69 years later, he said that conversation was the most important conversation of his life because it taught him he had a weakness in himself and that he had to conquer it. And that weakness was his temper, his anger, his passion. If you read books about Eisenhower, he's, he, or just seen clips of him on YouTube or something, he looks like this country club charming guy, always chuckling, very happy. That was a total front. He was during World War II and while president, a furnace of anger and anxiety. He was up late at night, he had throat infections, he had stomach problems, he had insomnia, he was smoking like a chimney. But he knew that in order to lead, he had to project an atmosphere of calm, optimism, and cheerfulness. So he faked it. And he faked it because he needed to do that on behalf of the job he was given. And to do that, he had to conquer his anger and his passion. He would do things like he, was, he hated people so badly, he, if he found somebody he hated somebody, he'd write their name on a piece of paper and rip up the piece of paper and throw it in the garbage can. He had all these devices to conquer anger. And so the people we have call character have this ability to take what's weakest in themselves and make it their strongest. I have a friend who's a minister in New York. His weakness, he says, is that he's not always present for people when they need him. They come to him asking for advice, asking for comfort, and he's got like a million things going on in his mind. He's like sort of paying attention. So he sits at night and thinks about when that moment happens, how the next day he can be better at being present for people who are in need of suffering. So the third thing we'd say is that to make your weakest spot your strongest spot, practice self-defeat. The fourth thing we'd say about somebody who has character is they've got a vocation. They've got the ability to focus their lives on one core act of service, one avenue of service. There was a woman named Frances Perkins who was the first woman in the cabinet and she, she, uh, in, in the US history. She was Secretary of Labor under Franklin Roosevelt. She was a young woman. She was in New York. Uh, if anybody knows New York, Washington Square Park, there's this big arch and there's a bunch of brownstones on the north side of the park. She was having tea, she was rich having tea with a bunch of high-born ladies, 1911. And uh, she hears a commotion. They all hear a commotion out in the street. So she rushes out, and they look down the square, and they see this gigantic fire. And they've stumbled across one of the most famous fires in American history. It was called the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. And so she rushes over, and she sees from the 10th and 11th floor of this building what looks like bundles of clothing being thrown out of the windows. But it was like 9-11, people were pushed by the flames to the windowsills, and they had the choice to either jump to their deaths or to be burned to death. And so they chose to jump. And she sees 57 people go off this way. And there was one guy who's helping the young ladies, who mostly were in the factory, over the windowsill and then dropping them into space. And he helps a first and a second and a third, and the fourth is his girlfriend. He gives her a kiss, drops her into space, and then he himself goes over the end. And at that moment, Frances Perkins found her calling. Now some people, when you, if you go to commencement addresses, people are told, you know, find your passion, look inside, see what your passion is. That's really bad advice. Frances Perkins didn't look inside to find where her passion is. She looked at the world and said, what problems need solving and where the world's greatest problems meet my greatest pleasure. And so she, it was not what she wanted from life, it was life, what life was questioning her to do. It was questioning her to work on worker safety and labor regulations. So she goes up to Albany, which is capital of New York, she's lobbying the legislators to put in worker safety legislation around the factories. She's like 24, it's 1918, 1920 by this point. The politicians up there are not taking her seriously. And so, but she keeps at home a folder called Notes on the Male Mind. And she realizes that the guys won't take her seriously as a young woman, but all guys want to be loved by their mothers. And so she dresses up like an 80-year-old woman, 
frop, frumpy, gray dress, pearls, tricorner hat, and she gets the nickname Mama Perkins. And she becomes a phenomenally successful uh, labor, uh, first a lobbyist, and then a regulator, and then Secretary of Labor. And so she suppresses her looks, her attractiveness, to be an instrument for the cause, and spends her whole life serving that one long cause. That's a vocation, being formed by a cause, not being formed by something you want to do. The third, the fourth thing uh, that we would say somebody with character has is loyalty to an institution. Loyalty to an actual organization. And so I hope many of you have read about George C. Marshall, probably the most esteemed member of the military in American history in the 20th century, even though he was from a different branch. Uh, we think of him, if you've read about him, as this august, austere uh, man, completely self-possessed. He was not that way as a child. He was something of a disaster as a child. He embarrassed his father. He failed out of school. He was timid. He was a terrible student. His brother, older brother, went to Virginia Military Institute. He wanted to go, and his older brother was begging his parents, do not let George go to VMI. He will disgrace the family name. He gets to VMI, and he still is not a good student, but there he discovered military discipline, and he could structure his life around the discipline of the military. I shouldn't tell you this, but they had a, um, a hazing ritual uh, where they, it was called squatting on infinity, where they took a bayonet, stuck it in the floor, and you had to squat over it for 10 minutes. And fortunately, he, when everyone collapses, you can't do it. Uh, he, he fell off to the side and only got a flesh wound. But in that discipline, uh, he found not only the capacity for discipline, but also service to an organization, service to the U.S. Army. And so the Army shaped him in ways that were good and bad. I think it made him a little more emotionally restrained than it needed to, but it also gave him tremendous inner strength and a tremendous selflessness. My favorite Marshall story occurs like in 1943, and it's when Franklin Roosevelt is deciding to, who's gonna run Operation Overlord, the D-Day invasion. And everyone assumed it would be Marshall. He was the leading general at the time. Stalin told him he would get the job. Churchill told him he would get the job. He desperately wanted the job, but he thought he could do it well. Um, so, Roosevelt calls him into the Oval Office and says to him, General Marshall, would you like to run Operation Overlord? Marshall could have just said yes, but he had a code. His code was, I will never put personal ambition above service to the United States, and so I will never lobby for myself. So instead of saying yes, he said, Mr. President, my own personal ambitions should have no bearing on your decision. And Roosevelt asked him four times, and four times Marshall said, it's not about me, you do what suits you. And Roosevelt took the chance to give the job to Eisenhower, could keep Marshall close to him in the White House, send Eisenhower over London, and Marshall was crushed on that day. And so on that day, his code of service hurt him, hurt his career, but he wouldn't have been Marshall without that. And that's because he had a different mentality than many of us have today, especially in civilian life, which is we don't have an institutional mentality. We don't have a primary commitment to an institution. We have a primary commitment to ourselves. But a person with an institutional mindset has a very different mindset. It's not like the world is sort of this blank sea that you're sailing through. There are institutions that existed before you were born that will be here after you die. You inherit those institutions, and your job is simply to pass them along slightly better than you found them. Each institution comes with certain rules and the standards of excellence. Scientists have certain methods that make them scientists. Reporters have certain rules that make you a good reporter. Teachers have certain rules. And those rules form who you are. The institutionalist has a deep reverence for the people he came before, is formed by the identity of the profession deeply woven into their person. There may be years if you're a teacher or if you're in your line of work, where you will put more into your institution than you will get out. And it'll, those will feel like negative years. 
because you're not getting the psychic rewards, you're just putting in. But the institution is so deeply woven into the person, they don't quit because it's their identity. They're a teacher. They couldn't help but not be a teacher. And so that's a different sort of mentality. And so I've sort of described a whole bunch of different activities that lead to character, I think. Love, suffering, vocation, self-policing, commitment to an organization, institution. They all have the same shape. They humble you. Humility, some people think humility is like having low self-esteem, but that's not what humility is. Humility is accurate self-awareness from a distance. It's having an accurate understanding of who you are. So they humble you, they take you out of yourself. Another piece of humility is not thinking about yourself. It's like if you walk into a party and you're thinking, how am I coming off? You're not gonna be very successful at that party. You'll be very successful if you're not thinking about yourself at all. So self-forgetting, self-quieting, and then service. And so these are the basic shape that leads people into having uh, character. The question becomes, how do you teach character? I once tried to write a column about this, and I've sat in the class you guys are taking. And I think you can learn a lot, as I've tried to do, by reading about exemplars, people who set examples for us. I think you can learn a lot by discipline, by doing the drills you guys do. But the, the best advice I got on how to teach character, I wrote about this in a column. I got an email from a veterinarian named Dave Jolly in Oregon. And he said, you can't teach character in a classroom uh, because everybody's busy and distracted. And then he, he said these sentences which rung in my head, which is what a wise person says is the least of which they give. That what gets passed along is not what comes out of their mouth, it's their habits of consideration habits of honesty, habits of behavior. And then he had the sentence, never forget the message is the person. Which was, and each person was formed by some mentor who was formed by a mentor who was formed by a mentor stretching back to the dim mists of time. And those two sentences have rung in my head. That what a wise person says is the least of which they give and the message is the person. And so these are the sort of things that what character, uh, how it gets passed along. And the benefits of character is a certain stability and self-respect. Self-respect is sort of different from self-esteem. Self-esteem is when you're better than other people at something, but self-respect comes when you're better than you used to be at something. It's not defeating other people, it's defeating yourself. And self-respect is quiet. I was up in Frederick, Maryland, I, I visited some people who uh, tutor immigrants to teach them English and to teach them to read. And to teach a middle-aged person to read takes a long time, it can take seven years. And these mostly women were taking seven years for one person. An amazing act of patience and service. And what struck me was that they were, they, there was a quiet to their voice. In some ways it's the same quiet I've heard in men and women who've seen combat who have nothing left to prove, who do not need to brag about themselves, who don't need to show you how distinguished they are. Those people just seem a little more interested in you. They make you feel funny, they make you feel smart. And there's just a tranquility and a hush. One of my heroes is a guy named St. Augustine who lived 15, 1600 years ago. St. Augustine had the helicopter mom to beat all helicopter moms. This woman named Monica, she was all over his life at every second, who he should marry, where he should go to school, what he should believe, screaming at him. He became, at the end of the life, the sort of Christian he wanted her to, she wanted him to become. And she was like 55, and she said, you know, Augustine, I've, all my life I've wanted you to be this, and you're finally this. So my time here is done. She was essentially telling him she was ready to die. And he describes the scene where they sit in a garden and they have a final conversation. And he talks about how sweet it was. After all these years of conflict, how sweet it was. And then he has a long sentence, which is impossible to read, it's really long. But it's got one word that keeps getting repeated over and over again. And that word is hushed. 
And so he says, the, the sound of the trees were hushed, the sound of the birds were hushed, the sound of the wind was hushed, the sound of our voices was hushed. And we slowly fell into a silence of pure spirit. And what he's describing is a tranquility. A lot of us are working hard, trying to get better, trying to achieve more. But at the end, the person who has character just has a tranquility and contentment that you see in their eyes. Because they've proven to themselves they can be counted on in time of testing. And so I'll leave you with a quote from uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, who was a theologian in the 1950s, who captures up some of what I've been saying. Nothing that is worth doing can be achieved in our lifetime. Therefore, we must be saved by hope. Nothing which is true or beautiful or good makes complete sense in any immediate context of history. Therefore, we must be saved by faith. Nothing we do, however virtuous, can be accomplished alone. Therefore, we must be saved by love. No virtuous act is quite as virtuous from the standpoint of our friend or foe as it is from our standpoint. Therefore, we must be saved by the final form of, of love, which is forgiveness. And when you go through life, a lot of you are engineers. A lot of you will be in ships and submarines and Marine Corps. There will be that emphasis on promotion and uh, all the stuff that goes into making a successful life that gives you status. But I do hope you'll set aside to think about things that are not encouraged and hard to talk about for a lot of us. Things like love and suffering. Because if you do not have that eulogy virtues, everything will fall apart. And ultimately, you've got to get to a point where Adam 1, the external Adam, bows down to Adam 2, and you can experience some tranquility. So thank you very much. We now have time for a few questions. So if you could please make your way to the microphones on the concourse. I could talk about Katy Perry, too, <laughs> or politics. Good evening, sir. Third class, Raymond. 20th time. Yeah. So, sir, we live in a success-driven society, and this drive brings with it a lot of pressure. Now, we also have character flaws that, because of these pressures, cause us to buckle and hide these character flaws rather than fix them. Earlier, you asked how to teach character, but my question is, how do you build courage to practice good character? That's a good question. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I, uh, I gave a talk at the, uh, the National Defense University about five years ago, and I was, um, introduced by a Navy pilot, and before I met the guy, people said, this guy's amazing. He's landed on every carrier in every condition. He is the bravest guy any of us ever met. And so it's an audience about a third of this size, and he introduces me, and he gets out there, and his knees are shaking, his throat is dry. And so here's a guy capable of tremendous courage in one context, and it didn't translate over to another context. A lot of people are afraid of public speaking. I'm not afraid of that, but believe me, flying would you know, scare the crap out of me. <laughs> and so I think one of the things that teaches you that courage is almost never natural. Some people are risk takers, and some of that is genetic. There's a guy who did an experiment where they, he, he took babies at age like um, six months, and he dropped little droplets into their mouths and it was salt water, salt water, sugar water. And some babies, when they get the shock of the sugar water, they react. And those babies are not risk takers later in life. Some babies don't react at all. The change does not cause them to react. So to get the thrill of, a, of risk, they have to take awesome risks. They become parachutists and bungee cord jumpers. So some of it is genetic, the, the desire for risk. But the main thing that courage, um, comes from, it seems to me, is it's artifice. It's not natural. It's not an innate trait. And that it only comes from uh, 
having been there and done it a lot. Uh, and so the, you know, the things I notice in people who were in combat when I was a reporter covering all that, or in people in scary situations, or even in airline pilots. Tom Wolfe wrote a great book called The Right Stuff. I highly recommend about the space program and the early flyers. And there was a guy named Chuck Yeager. And Yeager set speed records in airplanes. And he, um, the tougher things got, the calmer his voice got. And if you go on an airplane now, every pilot comes over the intercom, they have Chuck Yeager's voice. They all adopted that voice. That became the official voice of pilots. And it was that steadied extra calm in moments of high stress. And so that's why I think it's just repetition. Courage is, is an artifice, it's not natural. And it just comes from being in the same place and doing the same thing uh, over and over again. Thank you, sir. Sir, third class, Matt Robbins. Um, you mentioned uh, Dwight Eisenhower and said that he was a furnace of anger, but put on a face of cheerfulness and optimism. So my question is, how do we put up a front that might be necessary to lead while still remaining genuine and uh, vulnerable? That's actually, this, uh, I cover a lot of politicians, uh, and I, uh, I was given a good piece of advice, which was to interview three politicians every day. And so I meet a lot of uh, leaders, some in the military, but also in, in political life. And the ones I admire most are those who have a dual consciousness. There are certain things in your job that you have to say. Um, but there are certain things, it's important to reserve the ability to actually have an honest opinion, in, even if it's only inside your own head. And what I find is people lose the ability to have that honest opinion. I covered, um, I'm, how am I gonna tell this story? I covered John McCain a lot for about six years. And what I'd, he'd go out and be a politician and say whatever politicians had to say. But if you were back in the van with him or you were at a bar drinking, uh, he still had complete honesty in his head. And the way I would get him going, uh, he, he was a guy who was motivated by the things that offended him. So if you wanted to start a really good conversation with him, you'd pick the person he hated most at that moment and say, what do you think of Rick Santorum? <laughs> and he'd say, F and A-hole, and then he'd go off. Uh, uh, and, and that would get him going because he had this honest opinion. And the, the, it's the paradox, so you'd think the hard thing to keep up would be the facade. The hard thing to keep up is the genuine con conscience. And so the one thing I would recommend is keeping a journal with what you actually think, or else you lose contact with it. During the Civil War, uh, one of Lincoln's aides was a guy named John Hay, and he kept a diary. And you read his public pronouncements, the war's going great, we're winning, everything's under control. You read his private diaries, holy crap, we're losing, it's terrible. But he had to keep that two sides, because you've got to keep that inner integrity and not let it get bleached out by the stuff you say in, in public. Thank you. Sir, Midshipman Third Class Stroop, during your speech tonight, you've mentioned uh, many different authors and books. Are there any specific books or authors that you would recommend that discuss some of the topics about which you talked? I would I recommend a couple, just off the top of my head. Uh, I recommend a book called Man's Search for Meaning by a guy named Viktor Frankl. Frankl was a, 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 a psychologist in Germany, or in Austria, and started World War II. He was put in the concentration camp, and uh, he said, you know, this wasn't life, what life chose for me, but I got stuck here. So it's, he said, what is life asking me to do? And they, he said, what life is asking me to do is first of all, be worthy of my suffering. I can't control what the Nazis do to me, but I can impose an internal check, I can re impose my, rea my response to what they do to me. So it was, it was about emotional self-control, and then he decided that he was going to um, use the camp to study suffering. And he discovered that what people want in all circumstance is meaning. They want to know that what they're going through has meaning. There's a phrase from the philosopher Nietzsche, uh, a person who has a why to live for can endure anyhow. And so he wanted to say, what's my meaning here? And once he established that there was meaning here, that life is expecting stuff of him, 
he could live even under worse circumstances. So that's man's search for meaning. I mentioned the lonely man of faith. Dorothy Day, who I quoted, she wrote a book called uh, The Long Loneliness, which is about spiritual hunger. And then the final book I'd recommend is a book, which I hope you've read, called War and Peace, which is uh, by Tolstoy, obviously. It contains a lot of things. It contains what many people tell me is a very pers persuasive and accurate sense of what it's like to be in combat and the chaos of that. But then also a theory of history. And the theory of history is that life is so complicated that the generals on the top of the hill don't really control what's going on. Admirals, of course, do, but generals don't. Uh, uh, but that there's such a chaos. There's a scene where the general's on the top of the hill, the Russian general, he sends his men into the valley, and they walk into a fog. And that general pretends he controls events, but he has no control over events. And it's a humbling reminder of how little we control our lives uh, and how life is often just a chaos. And then the final famous piece of that book is the two different mentalities. I, I love dualisms. Uh, there are two sorts of people in the world, those who divide the world into two sorts of people and those who don't. Uh, I, I do divide the world. And it's a famous dualism called the hedgehog and the fox, about two different mentalities. Foxes are people who know a lot of different things, and their mind is very agile. A f hedgehog is someone who knows one thing, and he keeps coming back to that one thing. And I think the lesson of Tolstoy is you want to be a fox and not a hedgehog. You want to be agile and know, see the world from a lot of different perspectives. So those would be a couple of the books I'd recommend. Um, and then I'd recommend, finally, uh, a fantastic book that's coming out April 14th <laughs> called The Road to Character by David Brooks. I would definitely do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sir, on behalf of the Naval Academy, we would like to present you with this gift to show our gratitude. Thank you. Stand by. Attention on deck. Dismissed.